in, in 1980, I got led to go to the, the, the A7 Club, which you know, didn't even know what it was, that didn't really have a name, the music didn't really have a name except we called it punk rock. That's where it started, and just started going there on more of a regular basis on weekends, you know, in between school. Started dragging my friends over. It was just like some kids playing loud, you know, loud, fast, and having fun. And you know, there was like other people that were uh, that I recognized later on as being in other bands. Like you know, I knew Billy Psycho because he lived in my neighborhood. Stefan from the False Prophets. I, you know, that's who basically showed me where the place was in the middle of a snowstorm while he was while he was wheat pasting. While I was asking him all these questions about like, what is this? Where you know, where do I go? John Watson, he made it a dance. He, he actually made it a dance. And we, like, we watched his moves and we were trying to like, how do we do that? How do we make our body do that, you know? Eric would do like this giant frog leap thing, which nobody could actually duplicate. I mean, he would get about this high, you know, boots like in your eyes like this. Let's see, Diego was another one. And I, frequently Diego and John would be like, they would be the ones everybody would be watching them, you know, like, how do we do this? Well, A7 was, Quite a long time ago, we all like felt bad that it had to close up. You know, two plus two tried it, and for me, I mean, I, I after that, it was you know, it was CVs for me. I mean, it was familiar. I got to know Hilly. Miss playing there, uh, being on, you know, getting on stage in there for the very first time was like, this is like awesome. You know, it was like when we first came with our first record, coming back from the pressing plant with a thousand seven inches in, in, on the subway and assembling them in my living room. I miss CVs a lot. I mean, it, as much of a crap hole it could be, you know, uh, the sound was perfect up on stage, the sound was excellent out on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the floor, um, it was a good place to go to. I, I wish I'd seen Minor Threat in, in, in DC, it never did. Wish I'd seen SSD Control in Boston, never did. But then there was that DC versus Boston versus New York, you know, totally unnecessary, but it was like, you know, like, it was like football rivalry. You know, the town over has got, you know, like, you guys suck, and this is why. And, like, everybody was like, why? <laughs> you know, why do we do this? I just want to go see a show, and you guys, you know, you guys actually play good music. I want to see you without getting kicked in the head for no reason. I learned how to hide my glasses real fast, because glasses are expensive. So if you see a lot of the pictures of me and all these other publications of stuff that comes out, you see me without my glasses, but I, believe it or not, I did wear them. Yeah, 81, 82, 83. Uh, just when things were starting, I mean, a couple of the, sh you know, couple of the early shows at CB's, uh, seeing, uh, seeing uh, the Bad Brains open up for Shrapnel, who were, you know, I knew, got to know those guys because uh, they're from the same you know, region in New Jersey where I was from. But going to see, see the, like getting awed by seeing the Bad Brains on stage at, at, at uh, CB's. Uh, probably the next one would be seeing, it would be like the Misfits at, at uh, the Ritz. Uh, the one that was actually, you know, the one that was recorded. Black Flag, uh, anytime they got into New York, some shows were not that good, some shows were awesome, depending on what, you know, who was sick and what, was, what else was going on, you know. A lot of the Irving Plaza shows, that's another place that I really liked. Irving Plaza was great. Around that time I was also on the radio station at, uh, at, at Pratt. It was an AM radio station carrier current, uh, but we, you know, played around with some things we actually broadcast out, but we would get tickets for Irving Plaza a lot. Seeing the Misfits Irving Plaza and, you know, Kraut. If you got to play Irving Plaza, that was like the big, the big stage. You know, the next step is, you know, Madison Square Garden, you know. In some ways, I feel kind of bad about bringing him into the scene because I could step away from it because I was going to school. I mean, I had a job, things like that. I could step away and not get sucked into a lot of the stuff that was going on down the Lower East Side, which, could, which was ultimately harmful to many people. And my brother got sucked into it really deep. He's no longer with us, and that's one of the reasons why. I mean, I still feel bad, you know, but I mean, he became part of, you know, part of legend, and, you know, I still get called Willie Noedge's brother uh, by people who forget my name is Jan. <laughs> but he loved New York Hard. He did, he did. I mean, uh, uh, it was, uh, he, he made it his own. Johnny Ramone showed me that I could do it, and I'm, since I'm left-handed, I could watch him and mirror image, and then of course go home and play it over my headphones and, you know, and play along with it. Alex, Cause for Alarm, uh, Agnostic Front, Stigma from Agnostic Front, 
and Doug Holland from Kraut. I mean, that's, that's the, from, the, from New York. Being, being in SFA for 10 years, I mean, it's actually, it, it's actually amazing now after all this time that there's people that are like, once they find us on Facebook, like, like you changed my life. And like, what did we do? We were a bunch of stupid kids from, from Brooklyn and Queens playing, you know, playing, playing punk rock extra fast. And it's like, we, it was kind of weird. We almost sort of, we were, like a, we were like a family that sort of didn't like each other very much, but we still did it anyway. Yeah, we fought. I mean, that was just part of the thing, you know, we, you know, me and John still talk to each other all the time. Um, Billy occasionally. I mean, he's like he's a professor at Columbia University now. Um, it's you know it's it's amazing after after all this time. I mean, we made you know, three LPs and those European tours and like here in the states, yeah, people collect our records, but in Europe they actually listen to us, and I, I still can't figure out why. That you know that was because like you know the the kids were, were screwing things up for CVs and some of the other places nobody wants them to play, and ABC just happened to be there to uh, to fill in the gap. Kind of odd to be playing while it's raining inside. It was fun, you know. It was it was something that we generated ourselves. It wasn't like an adult that was 20 years older than us allowing us to play in their living room kind of stuff. ABC was uh, the kids doing it themselves. We set up our you know we set up the shows. We booked everything. They started doing weird things with like, you know, um, censoring bands for stuff that they said and going like, you know, they're saying things that are coming out of them. As long as they're not beating the shit out of you, don't worry about it, you know? I don't believe hardcore is dead. I think it's, it's just evolving into other things, different people doing it, different ages, different things to say.